Shadow Accountants Academy video lectures. My name is Philip Jambati. And so the first thing I want to uncover today and the objectives that we're going to cover are firstly to understand the principle of withholding tax and secondly to understand the different types of withholding taxes. Now, what is the principle behind withholding taxes? Firstly, withholding tax is generally a collection mechanism. This is allows Zimra to capture certain taxpayers who are not normally covered within the normal tax system. For example, your delinquent taxpayers, which are not registered taxpayers, and your foreigners. Withholding tax is also a final tax when it comes to shareholders' taxes, or it can also be a deduction on a taxpayer's liability, for instance, your capital gains withholding tax. Now, what are the types? of withholding taxes that are available. So there are three broad categories that withholding taxes try to cover, which is mainly delinquent taxpayers. As I said, these are not registered taxpayers. And you talk about foreigners, and you also get your directors. These are the three broad categories that are covered under withholding taxes. So let's get into depth with it. What withholding tax covers delinquent taxpayers? This will be a withholding tax on contracts. And this is covered by section 80 of the Income Tax Act. Now, what it generally covers, the key terms you need to look at here are firstly contracts and the definition of a contract and the definition of a consumer contract, which you'll find under section two. So, what withholding tax on contract generally covers is that if one, the tax payer or person receiving a payment does not have a valid ITF 263, otherwise, you're a valid tax clearance certificate, the person paying that client will need to withhold a certain amount from every payment he makes. As long as that payment is above a thousand dollars in aggregate, note in aggregate in a given year of assessment, then the person making the payment will need to withhold a rate of 10% from every payment he makes. Now let's further clarify what we mean by this by giving you an example. So looking at our example here, we have X limited who decides to buy raw materials from Y Limited, and the amount of the raw materials will be $5,000. So if Y Limited does not have an ITF 263, X Limited will need to withhold 10% from the payment he makes to Y Limited. However, things can change if, say for instance, if the payment is now spread over 10 months. If the payment starts in November, for a given year of assessment, is the aggregate going to be over a thousand? That's what need. That's what X Limited needs to ask themselves. If the aggregate is going to be over a thousand for any year of assessment, excuse me, then X Limited will need to withhold ten percent. Another way you can look at it is what how, what happens if X buys these raw materials for five hundred dollars every month for the next ten months? Does that change the withholding tax, or does it not? So what you need to know is that withholding contracts, withholding tax on contracts are based on contract amounts thus spreading the payments over time does not really change the outcome of the withholding tax. When the aggregate amount goes over a thousand, the paying office will need to start withholding the amount on the payable that has been given. So note, consumer contracts and sale or supply in the ordinary course of business through shops is not included in the definition of a contract. <clears throat> so what that means is when you buy from Ahmad Musa or you're buying from TM, such supply or sales do not, are not subject to withholding taxes. So when you go and spend or splurge in TM, do not worry, TM will not have to withhold. You will not have to withhold 10% from the payments you make to TM. Consumer contracts are basically mainly to do with payments that are made where further conversion will have to be made. So understand that spreading the payments over time does not necessarily change the withholding tax. What is key here is based on the aggregate amount for the year. So once that goes over a thousand, the paying office will need to start withholding 10%. Now let us look at uh, the next link or category we are looking at for withholding taxes, which are non-executive directors. Now, what is the source for our information? 
we need to start looking at Section 36J as read with the 33rd Schedule of our Income Tax Act. What are the key terms we need to look at when we're looking at non-executive directors withholding tax? What we need to be key here is that we need to define what a non-executive director is. So these non-executive directors are people who earn or are paid amounts that are not subject to payee, whether they're resident or not resident. These, once a director gets paid a fee that is not subject to pay as you earn, that amount will be considered a fee. And specifically for non-executive directors, as executive directors also earn what we call remuneration, which is covered under your payee. So whether they're resident or non-resident, you will need to withhold how much? The rate for non-executive directors, the rate is 20%. So please get it correctly. We need to really know your employment income because that is where you find the definition of amounts that are subject to pay as you earn. If you do not understand which amounts are subject to pay as you earn, you will not be able to suss out what a non-executive director is and therefore you won't be able to withhold the necessary amounts. Next, we're going to look at non-resident taxes. In this regard, there are three types of non-resident taxes. Your first one will be your fees, non-resident tax on fees, and also nextly will be non-resident tax on remittances, and lastly is your non-resident taxes on royalties. We're going to go through each one, covering the key terms and the source of information, and we'll then cover what rates later. So let us look at fees. The source information for fees is your section 30 as read with the 017 schedule. And what do we mean by fees? What are the key terms when we're looking at fees? So the first key term for fees is what constitutes a fee. So this is constituted by a technical, managerial, administrative, or consultative, consultative nature work that is done by any non-resident. So if a non-resident performs technical, managerial, or administrative, or consultative in nature work, and gets paid for it, that amount is called a fee. Now, in this case, when you're talking about fees, the person paying the fees or paying for this technical work should be a resident. And the person receiving the payment, the payee, should be a non-resident. And obviously, the payee, as we said, should be rendering services that are based on the definition. We also need to look at the exclusions to fees. These need to be noted and are put under your 17 schedule. Please go read the definition of fees and which amounts are excluded as far as fees are concerned. So again, please go over the key terms, which are, again, the definition of a fee, when, which kind of services become fees, and who is making the payment and who is receiving the payment. These are the key issues when it comes to non-resident tax on fees. When you look at remittances now, what is a remittance and where is the source of remittance? Obviously, first and foremost, the source of information we're looking at is the six, Section 31 of our Income Tax Act. Also, again, will be read with the 18th schedule. Now, the key terms when it comes to remittances are, first and foremost, allocable expenditure. You need to go look up at the definition in your Act under the 18th schedule. What is allocable expenditure? Again, it is linked to your technical managerial work but is allocable expenditure. And the way is this allocable expenditure spent will be necessary. And as far as remittances are concerned, it has to be incurred outside Zimbabwe. And like with fees, we need to now look at who is making the payment and who is receiving the payment. With remittances, the person making the payment will require to be a non-resident. And the person who is receiving the payment, again, is also non-resident. Note the difference between fees and remittances. With fees, the payer and the payee were different, but with remittances, the payer and the payee are both non-residents. Where do the fees? The payer was a resident and the payee was a non-resident. So when you talk about allocable expenditure, which is incurred outside Zimbabwe, but it needs to be for services that are being rendered within Zimbabwe. So in this case, the taxpayers are both non-residents. The taxpayer or the person withholding the tax is a non-resident, and the person receiving the payment is also a non-resident. But all this work is being happening within Zimbabwe, but the amounts are being incurred outside Zimbabwe. So you can look at maybe your bitumen world. 
for instance. These guys are performing work within Zimbabwe. In other words, they are the ones renovating our roads and have a contract with government to renovate our roads. But in this case, maybe they also need other assistance in maybe in civil engineering in terms of whatever planning they'll need to do. Maybe they need to hire certain civil engineers to give them some technical assistance. But then they hire a South African company to also help them with this technical work. Once they spend that money, when they're paying the, <coughs> excuse me, when they are paying the South African company, which is doing the civil engineering work for them, that will be then what we call a remittance. In other words, the South African entity, Bitumen World, is paying another South African entity, the civil engineer. And in this case, Zimbabwean government or Zimra will require Bitumen World to withhold a certain amount from the payment they're making to the civil engineers. That is what we call a remittance. Now, what are royalties? Royalties, the source for royalties, obviously, should be your section 31. Again, you'll need to look at the 19th schedule because that gives you the more detail as far as what royalties are concerned. And the key terms with the royalties are firstly, this is the right of use for intellectual property. Note, it's right to use intellectual property, not necessarily right to use physical or corporeal property. So in instances like this, we're looking at when I'm given a right to use a patent, usually even things like uh, copyrights, even uh, stuff like trademarks, this is intellectual property. Now, when you pay someone a royalty, you'll need to withhold it. And this is specifically looking at non-residents. When you're paying a non-resident for the right to use intellectual property of that non-resident. So if we buy a trademark from KFC, the amount we pay KFC for that franchise right or for the trademark rights, that is a royalty. And the owners of that trademark should be non-resident. And when they're non-resident, we now have a withholding tax on royalties. So what are the rates we need to look at? For all non-resident taxes, the rate is 15%. That is the withholding tax rate for all non-resident taxes. And the due dates for non-resident taxes is important. All need to be remitted within 10 days of the payment. So whenever you make the payment 10 days later, we need to remit the withholding tax to Zemra. So the next withholding tax we're going to look at are shareholders taxes, or what I call your dividends taxes. So these applies to both residents and non-residents. And these will be held when a distribution is paid out by local companies. And it does not apply to entities listed in paragraph two of your 15th schedule. So this mainly looks at withholding taxes are not subject when companies like Econet pay out a dividend to a company like Old Mutual, such dividend is not subject to withholding taxes because both Econet, because Econet is a company that is subject to income tax. But when Econet pays out a dividend to say Mr. Philip Chambati, such a dividend will have to be withheld. A certain amount will need to be withheld from that dividend payment. So it is important for us to know that. What are the rates when it comes to shareholders taxes? So when the company is a listed entity, you'll need to withhold 10% from the dividend. And when the company is a non-listed or other companies, the rate will be 15%. Now let us look at also the next one, which is your resident tax on interest. What is the source for this one? This is section 34, as read with your 21st schedule. So what are the key terms when it comes to interest? Obviously, there's interest to be paid by a financial institution, and the amount that is being paid should be interest. And what is the rate? So when it comes to loans and deposits and backing the symptoms and treasury bills, the withholding tax on that interest is 15%. When it comes to fixed-term deposits, which are a minimum of 90 days, the amount that is withheld from such interest amount is 5%. Now, what's the due date for interest payments? It will be the 10th day of the month following the month within which 
the payment has been made or any further time as approved by the commissioner. Now, thank you for listening to me. I hope you come to your the lecture of withholding taxes out having watched this video and having attempted the practice question at the end of the unit. Please come with preloaded questions and make sure you watch this video alongside your module as well as your legislation handbook. Otherwise, you will not get the full benefit of this video. It requires having your module next to you and your legislation handbook. For every act or section of the act that I have mentioned within the video, please look it up in the legislation, read it yourself, understand it. And then also after you finish watching the video and going through the module, attempt the end of unit question and come to the lecture well prepared. Thank you and good luck with your studies.